Windows machine. Um, we want to start with a very simple ping. Um, ping something that uh, we know should respond. Um, 8 that 8 that 8 that 8 Google. Um, by default, Windows will send only four pings, right? Uh, typically, Linux based machines will ping uh, forever uh, until stopped. You have to press Control C on your keyboard to stop uh, a never ending ping. Uh, in Windows, by default, we send only four pings. If you want to run something called a continuous ping, you would do um, space dash T or minus T. Make sure you include the space here, right? Ping 8.8.8.8 space minus T. This is uh, called continuous ping. So this will not stop until we press Control C on the keyboard. Control C is a good uh, universal escape sequence um, for any command line interface. This is like an escape button on your keyboard uh, in a graphic mode. Same way Control C will typically get you out of anything running on the command line. Um, so we did some simple pings here. Um, we just want to make sure we know how to read this output. Every line, in this case a reply, means a successful ping, another successful ping, line by line. Uh, we see where the reply comes from. That is the host that we were pinging. Um, <clears throat> bytes, 32 bytes. This is the, the size of our ping packet. Uh, as you can guess, almost everything is configurable. Uh, we are running a very basic ping, but we can set the speed of our pings, the time interval between our pings, the size of our pings, uh, the number of pings to run, uh, and many other values we, we can set and change here. But they, we, we don't we don't really need to do any of that right now. Uh, the next uh, value here, time. Uh, this is a pretty important uh, value to understand. Uh, this is the round trip time uh, the time it took uh, for our ping uh, round trip many people many people misunderstand this number um, oversimplified they call it latency right latency the time it took for our ping uh, but it's very important to remember what we're actually measuring here what time interval we're measuring here um, what we're measuring is the time it took us to prepare, form the ping packet, send it out. Uh, then the time it took the packet to traverse the network, the internet could be uh, on a LAN from host to host, could be across the globe, right? That time, and that plus the time it took the receiver to receive your ping packet, uh, process it, figure out what to do with it, prepare a response, package it up, send it out. Then the response will tra travel through the network again, make it to you. Uh, you will again receive it, process it, figure out what to do with it, put it out on the screen. Uh, so that whole process takes, in this case, 23 milliseconds. Uh, it varies. It's not a stable number. Uh, but it's round trip. It doesn't measure the performance of the network only. It measures the performance of two hosts, the sender and the receiver, and the performance of the network, both ways, back and forth. And so this number contains a lot, right? A lot is going on behind the scenes represented by one number. So <clears throat> sometimes people uh, misunderstand this and think, oh, so it, my latency is 23, so it means from A to Z, it takes me 23 seconds, uh, 23 milliseconds. Well, no. Actually, you have no idea how long it will take you to get from A to Z. Right? And you have no idea how long it will take you to get from Z to A. All you know is, like I said, the whole process takes 23 milliseconds. Of course, most of this, hopefully, most of this process will, will be attributed to the network latency. Uh, 
but you shouldn't forget about the, the, the fact that it takes some time for the computers or the CPUs to do the work as well. Sometimes you may run into a very busy or very lazy or very slow device, which may contribute to this time value severely. And you will be blaming the network for slow performance. And so it's very important to interpret this number correctly. Um, next, TTL. We discussed TTL in great detail, so this is it. In this case, by default, Windows decides to set the value to 55. So this means our ping will fail uh, if the destination is not found within 55 hops. Again, 55 is a huge number. I uh, can't imagine a network, you know, even if we're going across the globe, that would take 55 hops. If you're getting anywhere near this 55 number, and there's something wrong with the network or something wrong with the routing. You should uh, normally should never reach this number. Um, okay, so now let's ping something that uh, <clears throat> will not respond. Uh, let's try, I don't know, uh, let's try 6.6.6.6. .6 .6 .6. um, nothing fancy here. Um, the expected output is request timed out. Um, or no answer or something. It doesn't matter. The exact verbiage doesn't matter as long as we know we're not getting a response from anybody or anything. Um, all right, now we will switch to a small virtual Juniper lab um, to try some more pings. Uh, let's see, where is it? So here's a, here's a simple virtual Juniper lab. Uh, we have four routers virtual mx1 virtual mx2 virtual mx3 and virtual mx4 we will try to ping uh from virtual mx1 to virtual mx4 here's our virtual mx1 i already know that the destination ip address is 123.1.3 and we can ping that this is um junos juniper is a uh, unix based system so pings will run forever until I press control C once I press control C here the ping stops um, the output will be slightly different from what we saw in Windows but is again self-explanatory if you know your theory um, you will easily figure out what this means here um, we can take a quick peek at these values um, so these ping packets are you see uh, slightly bigger, 64 bytes in size by default. Uh, still pretty small packets. Uh, this is um, the IP address of what we were pinging. They actually are nice enough to do the sequence counting for us here. Sometimes these responses will arrive uh, in a different order, not not in sequential order. Sometimes you may see the responses arrive like 0, 3, 1, 7, 5, and so on scattered, which obviously is not a good sign. There's something wrong with the network. Um, uh, next uh, time to live, again, <clears throat> we know what it is. In this case, uh, Juniper decided to set the default value at 64, and that's a huge number for, uh, for any network even the largest network 64 hops i can't even i can't imagine any network that would require that many hops um <clears throat> and the time uh latency again be careful uh make sure you understand what this latency means um in this case the number is very small this is in milliseconds less than one millisecond uh that is because that we are in in a virtual environment so these virtual routers are probably running on the same physical device. That's why it's taking no time at all uh, to get from one router to the other. Uh, but um, typically, the actual time um, doesn't mean a lot. Uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, if it's one millisecond or 10 milliseconds or 70 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, uh, Usually it won't break anything. 
right? Things will work. And uh, you as a regular uh, general purpose user will never notice any difference. Uh, there are some time sensitive applications uh, and but, but usually it's not an issue for you unless you're in uh, high frequency uh, trading uh, where microseconds do matter when people make a lot of money by trading within microseconds that's where latency matters but other than that you should pay more attention to the variation in latency not the absolute uh, value of latency but variation of latency actually you can see it here as a standard deviation in this case of course um, <clears throat> There isn't much deviation. Our latency is great because we're not traversing anything major. Uh, but uh, variation in latency is called jitter. That that's a bad thing. Uh, it's uh, so high jitter is a lot worse than high latency. Um, uh, late latency uh, can also show you uh, where you cross the ocean when when going. Uh, from one country to another, uh, you may see uh, your latency increase from double digits to triple digits, um, where you transition to a um, submarine fiber cable. Um, that cable is long, takes some time to cross the ocean, uh, so it's pretty cool. Sometimes you can, from your from your pings, you can determine that. Um, okay, so this was a simple ping. It worked. Now uh, we will try to break this ping. We will go to router 4. Um, on router 4, the ping is permitted by default. Um, so <clears throat> here's our configuration. Uh, there's a firewall rule I wrote earlier to uh, block ICMP all of it regardless of what message type all I, all ICMP uh, we just need to apply this rule to uh, interface loopback zero and Juniper um, pings um, always communicate with interface loopback zero regardless of, of the physical interface where they come in <laughs> Okay, so this, this is our command to apply the <clears throat> firewall filter to block ICMP, incoming ICMP. Um, in Juniper, it's always a good practice to check what we're changing before we commit the change. And it's always a good habit to do something called commit confirmed in Juniper. We set the number of minutes after which the configuration change will revert back to the original state. In case I break something and I lose access to the router, it will roll back after the specified um, <clears throat> number of minutes. So in this case, I'm happy with my change. I didn't lose uh, access to the router. So I commit again and I exit the config mode and let's try Again, from MX1 to MX4, we just made the change on MX4. We blocked ICMP on MX4. Let's see if we can ping it. No response, nothing. Expected behavior. And the screen will stay like this. Unlike Windows, right? Unsuccessful pings will not show on the screen. We're pinging right now. You just don't see that. But if I stop, I do control C, and we will see the statistics, the results. We sent 22 packets until I stopped it. And we got 100% packet loss, of course. Expected behavior. Um, now, I will do one more funny thing on the router 4, just to show you what, what can be done in real life. 
this is somewhat security related. Um, so in this small configuration change that we applied, we said ICMP discard. Uh, this means any ICMP request that we receive, we will ignore it. We will not act on it. We will not do anything. Um, but Juniper also allows you to, as opposed to discarding, it allows you to reject ICMP. Um, in that case, it will respond by saying, nope, I'm not allowed to answer. I know you're trying to ping me, but I'm not allowed to answer. Um, I'm not sure what the purpose of this option is, to be honest with you. Um, if I don't want to be pinged, well, I probably don't want to be seen, and I don't to want to sh show anybody that I'm there. So I wouldn't want to re respond, but I'll just show you what it looks like if, uh, instead of discard, I will set this router to reject. Okay, so we have committed our small change. Um, commit it one more time because we are happy with the change. Um, exit config mode and let's try to ping this router one more time. Again, uh, we made a change on router 4. Um, instead of ICMP discard, we set it to ICMP reject. Um, tiny um, verbiage difference. Let's see what that does. We're going to router 1 and we're pinging one more time. Uh-huh. Expected. So in this case, <laughs> uh, we are getting a response from router 4, which we were pinging. It says communication prohibited by filter. Like I said, I am not sure what's the purpose of this option. Um, if you know, please uh, chime in in the comments to this video. Uh, I don't know why on this planet you would want to reject ICMP and notify uh, the source why or that that you are rejecting ICMP. I'm not sure why this this will be done. In real life, typically you always discard. Uh, if you want to block something, you don't reject. You discard. Um, okay, and one last thing I wanted to try. Uh, I want to create a routing loop to show you how time exceeded um, message will look. When we do a ping, we, w we should receive a response uh, indicating that uh, we have run out of our time to live hops um, and time exceeded error will pop up. So we will try to ping again from router 1 we will ping um, router 4 but I will make um, a routing change something you would never do in real life I will set a static route in router 1 saying that in order to reach router 4 you have to go to router 3 and router 3 will say in, the, in order to reach router 4 go to router 2 and router 2 will kick it back to router 3 so they will ping pong my ping packet here between each other and it will never reach router 4 so let's try and set that up
Okay, <clears throat> so we have uh, finished our configuration changes on routers 1, 2, and 3. Um, again, we will be pinging from router 1. We'll be trying to ping router 4, but we, we have added a static route on router 1, saying that in order to reach router 4, go to router 3. And on router 3, we made a static router change saying that for router 4, go to router 2. And from router 2, we will go back to router 3 and we will ping pong the packets back and forth forever. We will never reach router 4. Of course, you would never do this um, in real life. Looks like something stupid to do, but it will work great for our demonstration. From router 1, we will ping router 4. And yes, expected behavior. Stop it. Control C. Uh, 56 byte ping packets, just the size. Um, and what we wanted to see here time to live exceeded. We ran out of hops. And Notice this is very fast, right? Uh, the moment we press enter, almost immediately we start getting these time to live exceeded responses. Um, that's how fast we ran out of our um, TTL pops. Uh, so this pretty much concludes our uh, ping demonstration. Let's uh, summarize. 